Welcome to the celebration of diversity. This is a celebration of also recognizing Latinx heritage. Now, traditionally, it is a celebration that's recognized from September the 15th until October the 15th. Yet, I'm gonna ask you this question. Does any community only deserve recognition during one specific isolated part of the year? Our answer is no. My name is Asher Hamilton, and I'm the coordinator of the Office of Student Engagement right here at Four Cs. Welcome to an exciting presentation on disrupting anti-Blackness and gender policing. Gender policing is an attempt to regulate how an individual expresses their gender. The concept of gender policing is present in almost every aspect of our lives. From the clothes that we choose, the way that we wear our hair, the cosmetics that we choose, the hobbies that we select, gender even impacts the way we walk and the way we sit. Now, you and I both know there is no official book on how to be a man or a woman. These are unwritten rules that are held up and enforced through media. Media. In practically every show, every movie, newspaper, radio, we are taught how to do gender. Even Disney films tell girls how they must be docile, small, and patiently waiting to have a man save them. Now, according to the media, women are supposed to be passive. They must filter themselves sexually, emotionally, intellectually, so that they do not threaten, do not hamper what it means to be masculine. On the other hand, think about how masculinity is portrayed through the superhero franchises, video games, that convey violence, macho, aggressive masculinity that's dependent upon a woman being subservient. It doesn't matter the age, whether we're talking about children, we have a normative that we've created on how to do and perform gender. Now, today's presentation is not about preferred or acquired pronouns, but the intrinsic or correct pronouns that equate to identity. Now, interesting enough, I sent out a flyer today. Everyone on campus, some of you who are in the room today, some of you who will be viewing this as a recording, must have received the email as well as faculty and staff. I had a student respond and this student really took upon themselves to provide a little teaching. The person didn't call me out, but called me in. And I'm going to read to you what they said. I hope that it's not too weird for me to do this. But as a non-binary transgender student, I wanted to firstly thank you for acknowledging your mistake and putting in the effort to be more inclusive of trans and non-binary people but I also want to offer a couple of suggestions for better wording in the future. Most people do not like the terms preferred pronouns and preferred name. It's as if it equates to the pronoun like a favorite color or a favorite band, as opposed to the inherent fundamental part of a person's identity. I would recommend using correct pronouns and correct names in the future. It's more respectful to the intrinsic nature 
of a person's gender. Let's hold on to that. Intrinsic. The naturalness of it. One of the things I will say to you today, this is not a conversation about being tolerant. It's absolutely how do we accept and learn and not using phobia because there's nothing to be afraid of here. This is humanity. This is calling upon compassion, understanding. Our wonderful speaker today, taking their time out of a very flourishing, well-known consulting firm. Kay Martinez is here today, done so much around the topic and many other topics that really focuses on this very sensitive issue. If I look at their background, I look at some of the things that have been done with diverse issues in higher education, business insider, a space called Homies, how to create home ownership. This individual is here to teach, to really include on how we can create the best practices on supporting our transgender community. As I said, it's not about tolerance. It's about complete acceptance. I'd like to, I would like to introduce to you, Kay Martinez. Thank you so much, Asher, for that wonderful introduction, uh, for all your work organizing this amazing experience for everyone and for inviting me and for all the work you do on your campus. And I just wanna say hi and welcome to everyone who is here. Thanks for taking time out of your schedules as well to be here for this conversation. Um, truly honored uh, and excited to be here. So we can go ahead and get started um, with the presentation. Thank you so much. This is a uh, first time for me having tech support. So I usually advance the, the slides myself. So thank you so much uh, IT for doing that. So yeah, today we're gonna be talking about disrupting anti-blackness and gender policing in Latinidad. Uh, my name is Kay Martinez. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I uh, have a master's degree in higher education. Uh, it's the MA at the end of my name from Boston College. I actually grew up in Boston, born and raised in Brighton. My uh, parents are from Ecuador, which we'll get into later today. Um, but I've worked in higher ed for just over a decade. I've worked at universities all over the country. So Framingham State, Pine Manor, Boston College, Stanford, Harvard, Tufts. And now I'm at uh, MGH IHP, which is a Mass General Hospitals Institute for the Health Professions. So we're a graduate school focused on uh, health professions. And it's been a really interesting time to be there working with the next generation of uh, healthcare providers during a pandemic. I'm also an instructor there, created a course on JEDI, which is Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. A lot of schools use diversity, equity, inclusion, or DNI, but we have put uh, justice and equity at the front. So we use JEDI. I'm just waiting for Disney or Star Wars to, to find out. But until then, we're going to go with that. Um, so yeah, so we can go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody. Can uh, advance the next slide. Thanks. So as Asher um, was speaking, I just want to start by talking about the differences uh, of sex and gender and the relationship that uh, sex and gender have. They are two separate things, although often people conflate them and think that they're one and the same. But in this conversation today, we're going to talk about how uh, they are distinct. So I'm going to start with this concept. Uh, sex is something that is assigned at birth. So an institution in the United States, to be specific, a hospital assigns an individual when they are born with a sex. So you see this little graphic I've created. Uh, we start with like the big picture, right? Sex assigned or designated at birth. In the trans community, you often hear this acronym, which is uh, AMAB or AFAB, which stands for assigned male or assigned female at birth or uh, ADAB, uh, I'm sorry, DMAB or DFAB designated male or female at birth. Um, in the United States, for the most part in most states, you only have two options, you're female or male. There is a considerable movement 
uh, led by intersex people who have always existed to gain institutional recognition. So there are a few states, uh, New York being the first, where someone who's born intersex can have that on their birth certificate. So there are in fact uh, three, at least, sexes. So this idea of a binary, meaning two only, so this idea that there's only male and female, when we're talking about bio biology or even your natural birth, doesn't exist. So the binary does not exist. Uh, intersex people are showing us that you know, this system of just categorizing people as female or male is inaccurate. It does not represent them. It does not include them. So I, for me, I like to start here to dismantle this idea of a binary uh, by talking about the phenomenal work that intersex activists are doing to dismantle uh, the institutionalization of this uh, sex binary. So then you know, we've covered sex in one graphic, um, gender. So what does gender mean and, and how does that show up and how is it different? So I like this definition. There's many definitions out there about gender, but gender refers to the roles, behaviors, activities, attributes, opportunities that any society considers appropriate for people. So we just talked about the binary in terms of female and male, but there's also a binary enforced in regards to gender. So the binary for the most part in the United States is men and women. So people are assigned male at birth, they are then socialized to grow up to be a man. And as Asher was saying, you know, what does that look like? What does it mean to be a man? There is no one book, I think there's many books that talk about um, how to be a man, it's ingrained in, in society. And then on the other side, people who are designated female at birth uh, are then socialized and expected to be a woman or raised to be a woman. And it comes with all these other you know, gendered expectations, which Asher uh, was talking about too. So when I talk about gender, I want to distinguish it from sex, uh, which is assigned, and gender is something that is socially reinforced. This varies uh, all over the world. We have different cultural expectations for gender uh, and for men and women in particular. So I want to talk a little bit about my background as a Latinx person. My parents are from Ecuador, a little arrow there uh, in South America for you know, Latinx History Month, talk about the culture and some of the messages that I got as a young person and where I'm at now and, and how I'm trying to disrupt uh, and both anti-Blackness and gender policing. So here's a close-up of Ecuador. Uh, my dad is uh, from Esmeraldas, which is that top left circle. Uh, it's just by the coast. And my mom's family is uh, from Quito, which is more in the mountains, uh, indigenous people. So a story about Ecuador and how black people got to Ecuador. There's slavery uh, in South America as well. Brazil uh, is a very large uh, country that had uh, more slaves actually than in the United States across all of South and Latin America. So there's a legend that there was a, a ship of enslaved people that was uh, sailing further south uh, and the people, the enslaved black people on the boat organized a mutiny uh, and they took over the ship and the survivors uh, crashed on the coast here of Esmeraldas, Ecuador, and they created their own sovereign entity. So these folks who uh, were formerly enslaved people and survived lived off the land. They were able to create their own sovereign uh, space. And that's how black people uh, got to Ecuador. So for me, when I think about my ancestry, because I'm Afro-Latinx, um, I'm mixed race. And I, I find that as a source of pride that my ancestors survived, um, that they made a way out of no way and that they held on uh, to land and fought uh, colonization as long as they could. So uh, in Latinx culture, especially in, in my family, machismo was a big thing. And before, you know, I talk about uh, machismo, I see some nods. You know, I'm wondering if there's you know, any Spanish speakers on the call, uh, folks who identify as Latinx, who might have something to say about machismo, and what that means to them. If anybody cares to, to chime in, you can type in the chat, I think, just check in with uh, the tech folks if that's something people can do. So I like to make these spaces interactive uh, if anybody wants to share. But machismo in uh, Latinx culture, I think is similar to this idea of toxic masculinity, which uh, says that you know, men are superior, that men are to be strong and 
not emotional, you know, kind of cold, kind of rigid, that they're leaders, um, and that I think it's all based on misogyny, which is the suppression and domination of women, and also anyone or anything that is effeminate or feminine. So in Latino culture, uh, machismo is very present. So in my family, that looked like, you know, my dad uh, played soccer. You know, he loved sports and he was watching sports all the time. And my mom you know, was more domestic, was cooking, doing the cleaning. Um, and that, you know, I got some of those messages too as a young person who's being socialized to be a girl. So, you know, I wanted to play sports. I, I was more of a tomboy. I wanted to hang out with my dad. But I got messages immediately, you know, from the culture and, and from my household that like girls shouldn't do that. You know, girls should be home. Girls should be hanging out with their mom. Girls should have long hair. Girls should have all these kinds of things. And it's just a product of machismo. And patriarchy is not exclusive to Latinx cultures. We know that this is all over the world. It looks different in different cultures, um, but for Latinx people, this is a particular nuance for us. So for me, this is a baby picture of me. Um, I'm someone who you was know, assigned female at birth. Uh, you know, socialized to be a woman, expected to be a girl. And, you know, as Asher said in the introduction, the, some of the messages that I got was that women need to be subordinate. You know, they are to listen to men. They are to follow the leadership of men. We shouldn't be outspoken. We should be, uh, you know, more quiet. And as an immigrant to America, you know, a child of immigrants, there was a strong emphasis on assimilation which meant, you know, to, to fit in in America meant that, you know, my family would maybe downplay some of their own uh, histories and legacies to try to be more American. So I think in my house, uh, a good example of this is like Thanksgiving dinner. You know, my parents from Ecuador had no idea what Thanksgiving dinner was. And I just remember these conversations with my mom. And I was like, mom, I think we have to eat turkey or something. And she's like, what is a turkey? Like, we don't do this in Ecuador. So there's just like all these different attempts of like, my parents trying to you know, have us fit in with this culture and like go along with what's happening here. Um, and I think for women and queer and trans people of color by extension, there's also this pressure to assimilate. You know, we don't, we're not encouraged to be our full selves. We're not encouraged to break norms. There is an expectation that we'll be cis uh, heterosexual. And when you're not that, you, know, you can be made to feel like you're alone or that you're isolated. You don't really get that kind of encouragement in the same ways that other people do. Which brings me to this next concept of gender policing as you know, Asher described. So for me, you know, I already kind of mentioned, right? I wanted to do other things that were being presented to me. I wasn't really into uh, the domestic stuff, the cooking, the cleaning. I didn't really like the expectation to wear like dresses or you know, high heels or purses or makeup or lipstick. I really found this stuff to not be very practical. I was like, why don't dresses have pockets? Like, this is not working for me. Like I have a lot of things I got to carry and then, you know, so my mom was like, oh, you can have a purse. And I was like, but now I have another thing I have to be responsible for. It's so like, this is not, <laughs> this is not it for me. Um, but, you know, these messages, like you're supposed to do these things, uh, to me was the way that gender policing was introduced in my life. And not just in my house, but, you know, like reaffirmed by society. So I want to take a step back and just talk about policing. Now, policing to me is different than the police as an institution, right? So police officers or law enforcement. I wanna talk about the practice of policing at large or at in macro, right? Cause we're talking about gender policing. That's what we do to each other. It's what like my parents did to me. It's what society does to me. It's what the world does to each other. So we're not all, you know, police officers. We're not all uh, recognized as state entities but we all engage in a form of policing. So that is the key concept that I, I want to talk about today. So obviously, police officers, law enforcement, law enforcement uh, entities do institutionalized policing, but I'm focusing more on like the interpersonal policing that we do of each other. I learned something very interesting about policing. So I am quoting this article from Time Magazine, but there is additional. 
uh, subsequent supporting documents. And New Yorker had a great story on this, even the Boston Police Department's website. So I said I was born and raised in Boston, um, but I never knew that Boston was the first city in the United States that started the first uh, for-profit privately funded police force in 1636. So it was actually uh, set up by folks who owned boats people who were engaged in shipping commerce, that they hired you know, a bunch of people, some were actually volunteers, uh, but they paid for some to watch their ships at night to make sure that the ships weren't broken into and make sure that stuff wasn't stolen off of them. So to protect their property and their business is actually how the first recognized police force was started. And that you know, you'll see here that it was funded by individuals, right? So people who owned these ships, people who had an interest in this uh, collective of people watching their stuff. And then in 1838, Boston uh, decided that this entity, these people that were policing ships, uh, were doing a public good. And so this effort needed to be funded by everyone. And so in 1838, Boston started the first publicly funded police force in America, which I had never heard about, even though I lived here my whole life. And if you check out the Boston Police Department website, they will say that their origins actually came from you know, a night watch, like a neighborhood watch type of situation, which is uh, this like shipping entity. This is a story that I had heard more often, that when people were talking about the origins of the police force or policing, uh, that it was a derivative of runaway slave, slave patrols. And that is true. However, those started later. So in the South, uh, because they had slaves, uh, those who owned uh, enslaved peoples wanted to protect uh, their property, which were their enslaved people, because Black people were not seen as people. They were seen as property, uh, particularly those who were enslaved. And so like a similar raison d'etre or you know, uh, inspiration to protect the property as we saw in the North uh, was to create these entities who would ensure that the slaves were not stolen or lost uh, and didn't run away. And that happened uh, in the Carolina and South Carolina being the first in 1704. So this notion of policing and the police force uh, is something that I wanted to delineate and give a little bit more background to. And that you know, it's very connected to us in the Boston area. So for me, you know, facing the gender policing, so not the institution of police, uh, not the police officers, but the interpersonal policing, right? My family, the culture, society, um, really like put me at odds where I was someone who, as I said, you know, I was pretty masculine. Like I had an affinity towards things that were masculine. I wanted to wear shirts. You know, I really liked my dad's clothes. Uh, and so I'd be in his closet, like putting on his stuff. Um, and my mom like tried her hardest to be like, oh, are you sure you don't want to try this dress? I'm like, no, I'm good. Dad's clothes are cooler. <laughs> it still continues to this day. And, you know, in society, in American society, like some of that is encouraged or recognized as being a tomboy. And so, you know, this isn't like, unknown. This isn't like a new thing. And I think also my personality, you know, I was very assertive. I was athletic. Um, and you see me in this picture here with this like tutu, like I was not pleased, right? Like I was just not feeling this type of thing. Um, but when I started to embrace the things that I wanted to do, uh, that was like a yes for me. That's when I felt like, okay, even though everybody's telling me I need to do this stuff, I'm not going to do it. And when I started deviating from the norms and deviating from the expectations is when I think I started to find myself and my autonomy and feel good about who I was. Also, I was queer. And so being like a young queer person, I never saw that in movies or TV. You know, I didn't grow up with Glee <laughs> in that era. You know, we grew up in an era where we didn't have legalized same-sex marriage. Uh, don't ask, don't tell. You couldn't be out. Uh, publicly in the military. So that's what I grew up with. So in my era, I'm 35 years old, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> you could not be out in public in the same ways that you can be now. And we're still you know, working towards a society where we can be ourselves. Uh, and I don't know what's gonna happen with the Supreme Court in the future, but you know, there has been discussion about the future of same-sex marriage and transgender protections if uh, the courts change. So who knows? So, you know, I wanted to engage with y'all a little bit. Uh, so I just had a question here, if, you know, anybody wanted to share, you know, how your own gender has been policed. So in my opinion, this is my opinion, you know, I think all of us uh, are restricted in our gender expression. I think men too 
are restricted in their gender expression. You know, you are told that you have to be tough, that you shouldn't cry, that you shouldn't be emotional, that you have to be hyper masculine. You know, that if you do some things uh, that are effeminate, you know, men are also teased and they are, you know, punished and bullied for those things. So I don't think that it's just uh, an experience of policing queer and trans people. I think all of us, to some extent, are restricted. I think women, for sure, you know, they have been told across cultures, white women too, you know, don't speak out so much, uh, don't challenge things, you know, be pretty, be effeminate, be thin. So I think that all of us across races and across cultures, um, to an extent, have had uh, some of our gender policed. So I'm wondering if anyone cares to share uh, ways in which they think they may have also been policed. Uh, I see a hand raise, Karita. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, yes, you didn't, thank you. My comment is not as uh, so much as um, by being policed, but it is a comment on how machismo affects um, not only if you don't identify one way or the other, but it affects um, everyone. I grew up in Brazil and um, that culture of boys will be boys and girls are supposed to be, you know, cute and sitting at the table. So um, it was that we were having Sunday family dinner and the boys would get out of, get up, go play soccer and the girls would start cleaning up. And uh, from there are all sorts of uh, uh, that type of sort of culture, um, it, which was imposed um, on me for a really long time. Um, but it also didn't stop me from trying to do all the tomboy things that I wanted to do. Um, but it definitely um, impacted my, how I relate to um, my relationships. Um, what is the scope of um, freedom, I guess, or, or of interfering in my world? Um, definitely, my views are definitely shaped by that. Thank you so much for sharing. Does anyone else care to, to share? You can use the raise hand feature so we can call on you. I love hearing from you. Yeah, you know, I don't get out much. and. Uh, in the pandemic, so I'd love to hear from you. No, okay, cool, we'll keep it moving. Um, but thank you, Karita, for sharing. So we can just go to the next slide. Yeah, so some other ways that gender is policed. Um, are, there are laws, there were laws. So up until very recently, there were laws in the United States that outlawed cross dressing. So if you were someone who was you know, walking around uh, and a police officer, in this case, uh, felt that you were wearing clothes that belonged to another gender, you could be arrested. Um, so these were laws that were set up to target transgender people, particularly sex workers. Uh, and those laws uh, were in the books until at least uh, the 2000s. So here we are in 2020, um, where some of that, uh, well, some of those laws no longer exist, but I think their remnants remain. And particularly, I see that in companies, uh, Asher mentioned, I, I do consulting also, uh, where companies have dress codes that are pretty outdated uh, and they really restrict gender variant people, or transgender people like me, from wearing the clothes that they would like. So, you know, if you were someone who, you know, was maybe read as a man and you wanted to wear a dress one day, you know, there might be dress codes that would prevent you from doing that. And so a lot of my work with companies as a consultant um, is advising them on how to make more trans inclusive policies and creating resources like gender inclusive bathrooms, uh, which can be uh, a place for uh, confrontation and unwanted uh, violence uh, against uh, transgender people. So, you know, Asher mentioned um, some of the work that I do. I was featured in an article on the Huffington Post. This is just a, a snapshot of it, where I and some other queer and trans people of color were interviewed to talk about, you know, some of the issues that we faced in the workplace. So, you know, dress codes is a big one, also pronouns. Um, so not every 
workplace honors people's pronouns, um, also varies by state. So I personally feel very fortunate that I live in Massachusetts right now, which has explicit legal protections for transgender people and gender identity that varies by state. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm very afraid as a trans person, gender non-conforming person, what could happen in the next few years, we could see these laws being reversed or changed. And you know, I think another big way that gender is policed is through representation. So I mentioned, you know, growing up, I didn't really see queer people on TV. I didn't see gender non-conforming people on TV or in movies. And so without that representation, um, I think you're telling people, you know, this is what you're supposed to look like. This is what everybody looks like. And when you don't feel like that works for you, uh, I think it creates a lot of internal struggle. Now, in the Latinx context, so my family and my parents uh, grew up in Ecuador, and uh, I grew up here in Boston. So I wonder, you know, if there's uh, Latinx people on the line, if you grew up in a household that watched a lot of Telemundo. So in my house, you know, we'd watch like NBC News, and then we'd switch over to Telemundo. So we'd watch news in Spanish. And I don't know if y'all have watched like Latin American TV or Telemundo, but these are a picture of the news anchors, the women. Uh, and you'll see like a couple things. They're all very thin, uh, very feminine, so long hair. And if you look at their skin tones, uh, they tend to be lighter skin. There's only one darker skin person that I can tell from this picture. So for me growing up, you know, I, I'd watch this news and I'd, I'd watch like Brian Williams or <laughs> something on like NBC and it was like a really stark just juxtaposition where I'd see like white men on NBC news or like white women on news. Um, and then I would turn the channel, you know, and I'd see these Latino women who uh, also wore like much more revealing clothing than I would see on like American news. And so these these images gave me messages, you know, this is what Latino women look like. This is, you know, how I'm supposed to look like. And I didn't see any gender queer people in that picture. So I think the representation, uh, particularly in Latinx culture, sends you a couple messages. So a picture's worth a thousand words, right? So in this picture, as I said, I don't really see dark-skinned people and I don't see uh, gender queer people. So it made me feel you know, like an outsider growing up. Um, talking about skin shade representation is also a form of racism and you know, tying this to anti-Blackness. Um, you know, thinking about the privileges that you get as a lighter skinned person, like that image I just showed you, you don't tend to see darker skinned people in prominent um, positions on TV or news, rarely, uh, particularly for women. And so I wanted to just talk about that aspect of racism and anti-Blackness, um, and it's called colorism. So even for me as a mixed race person, you know, I recognize that I have privileges in being fairer skinned or lighter skinned uh, than darker skinned people like my father uh, or his side of the family. So I uh, wanted to transition to talk a little bit more about anti-Blackness. I think we've been seeing this term more in recent years, particularly with the Black Lives Matter movement. So what does anti-Blackness mean? So I quote uh, a recent article from the New York Times uh, defining what anti-Blackness is. So also in the past few years, we've seen uh, anti-Blackness more explicitly. So yes, racism exists, and then there's also anti-Black racism. So talking about the particular uh, experiences that Black people face is uh, important to distinguish. So you know, people of color experience racism, but it's very different. So what Latinx people experience, what Asian people experience, what Black people experience are not all the same, although it's all a form of racism. I think this movement is trying to draw attention to the particular experiences of Black people and naming that explicitly. So I like this quote in the article from Dr. Ross, uh, that anti-Blackness is a theoretical framework that illuminates society's inability to recognize Black people's humanity, the disdain, disregard, and disgust uh, for our existence, for Black people's existence. So what is anti-Blackness in a nutshell? It is the animosity directed uh, at Black people in the United States, we have a legacy of it. You know, I mentioned slavery uh, and the connections to policing and slavery, but also internationally and globally. So in South America, we also had slavery uh, and enslaved, enslaved people, as I mentioned. 
So here's like my thesis, and I would love to get your feedback on this, that the idea of policing, right, as we mentioned, uh, perpetuates anti-Blackness and the gender binary. So, you know, telling young children, for example, um, you know, you're a boy, you should act like a boy, wear blue, you know, play with the sports toys, play with the construction toys, and telling a young girl, you know, wear pink, here's, you know, cooking and cleaning, um, and you should be doing this. I, I think that that's a form of maintaining the gender binary, where in my world or the world that I'd like to see, you know, young kids are encouraged to pursue their interests, you know, and pursue their gender. So like, what would you like to wear today? You know, what do you want to learn? Do you want to learn science? Do you want to learn basketball? Do you want to learn dancing? That all children of all genders should have equal access to everything. That we shouldn't restrict these things based on gender. That they're people, that their gender um, is something that they will decide later. And policing, you know, I think also perpetuates anti-Blackness if we're looking at the connections to the institutionalized policing or even colorism in terms of representation of who is seen on TV. So we're you know, making these decisions as to who is going to be our, our lead anchor. You know, in that picture that I showed you, all of the lead women anchors were light-skinned. They were not dark-skinned people. So I think that that was an intentional decision. So I'm going to stop there, check in with y'all. What do you think about my thesis, if you will? Anybody? Hi, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, so um, I was lucky enough to go to a workshop a couple of years ago, and it was called History Unerased. And it was set up to increase representation of um, queer and trans people in the K-12 curriculum. And so, so that, you know, as you said, so, so that the students would see more people like themselves throughout history, and it was fascinating. But I wondered if from your experience, if you know if that is starting to happen like across the country, is, that, is it starting to get into the curriculum? Oh, great question. Thank you so much for asking. It really depends on the state. So what I do know is that we have, you know, groups of people who write textbooks, groups of people who determine curriculum. And so if we were in, you know, a state that is encouraging this, uh, we could see that. But then I know very well that there are states that are very conservative and are making sure that LGBT people are not written into books, that students do not have exposure to this. So I would say that it really varies on the state, that I've seen maybe things move in two directions. I've seen some states you know, who want to increase the representation of gender diversity and sexuality diversity in their curriculum. And then I've seen some other states who are like, absolutely not. Like we will not be teaching children about gender and sexuality at all, or if ever. And also, as an aside, in terms of race education, uh, I think we've seen over the past year, uh, this administration who has written executive orders to limit uh, certain aspects of race and racism being taught in schools. So the 1619 Project, which was led by the New York Times studying slavery, uh, has been explicitly targeted by this administration to make sure that it is not in curriculum. And then you have states like California who are mandating that 1619 is taught in its schools. So, yeah, it's a long answer to, to you to say that it really varies by state. And I think we're living in increasingly polarized times where people are just kind of moving to, absolutely, you know, let's talk about LGBT or like, absolutely not. Let's erase it altogether. So I, I try to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, I am seeing some really great things like Target, for example, um, over the past few years made uh, an, entire, an inclusive children's line of clothing. So they started to notice and people started to point it out on social media, you know, that boys t-shirts tended to be like, I'm a scientist or like NASA and the girls t-shirts tended to be like much more subservient and not encouraging those types of things. So they've just made a gender inclusive children's line. This is a t-shirt. This is a size. This is a message like wear it if you want to. This is not for boys or for girls. It's for children. So I've seen really great things that I want to highlight too. And I've also seen some things that are pretty scary. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? 
Any thoughts, comments at this point? Yeah, I do have a little bit more, but just want to check in. No? Okay. We'll keep going. Maybe we'll have some more questions at the end. Thanks. We can just go to the next slide. Great. Um, so here's an interesting point about me and my background. Um, so I mentioned I'm from Boston, right? I went to Boston College, which is a Jesuit school. I went to Loyola in New Orleans, which is also Jesuit. And I started studying more about Ecuador and, and history of uh, Latin America and South America. And I learned this fact that the Black people in Ecuador, uh, many of them were forced and enslaved to work on to work on plantations that were owned and managed by the Jesuits. And I was like, what? <laughs> I've been to Jesuit schools my whole life. And then I found out that the Jesuits uh, had most likely enslaved my ancestors. Um, and I just learned that you know Jesuits had kidnapped and enslaved Africans and brought them to work on their sugar plantations. And you know, I talk about colonization and I learned, I think because I'm bilingual, so I learned English and Spanish at the same time, that when I learn words, I try to find their root because Spanish and English are both Romance languages. And when you talk about colonization, the root word of colonization is colonus, which means farmer. So this idea of colonizing uh, is about land, taking land. Uh, and as we saw here in South America, making plantations uh, and enforcing Black folks um, to work on it. We can move to the next slide. So some particular anti-Black messages that I got in my household, but are not exclusive, these are definitely throughout Latin American culture. And if you are a Spanish speaker or Latino on the line, feel free to jump in the chat and let me know if you've heard these words too. So negra, uh, Black in Spanish, it's the literal color Black. Morena uh, is brown. Prieta is dark Black. And bambuda, a big is someone who has big lips. So these were the words that I actually heard in reference to me. So my family would you know, say this to me um, in their eyes as like jokingly, but this is how anti-blackness is embedded in Latinx communities. So for me being called negra, negrita, morena, morenita, um, you know, people would say to me, you know, refer to me by the color of my skin. And also bambuda, you know, so pointing out my features because I am Afro Latinx, because I am mixed race. Um, it's so it's kind of like so that I know that I am mixed, so that I know that I am um, not entirely indigenous or uh, European, that my ancestry is in fact black. And so these are ways that I think anti blackness shows up in Latinx communities. These are like terms of endearment, which are actually macro aggressions and highly anti black. So I did want to talk a bit about um, policing and transition into uh, some unfortunate things to discuss. Um, so just a content warning that the next slides are just going to share some data on police killings uh, and highlight some recent lives taken and discussing gender-based violence. Because we're talking about gender policing, right? So people like me who defy status quo. So people who do not want to conform. No, I don't want to be a man or woman. I'm not a man or woman. I'm not going to wear the things that you want me to wear. I'm going to be myself, right? This That comes with a consequence. Challenging systems of power comes with a backlash. Uh, and we are still very much engaged in a fight for our freedom and liberation. So as of yesterday, uh, this is a number um, that I obtained from this project called Mapping Police Violence. So now we're talking about institutionalized police, uh, where the police have killed 861 people in 2020 or 2020. So you see this little map here, it has all the red dots of where these instances uh, have occurred. Twenty-eight percent of those killed by police since 2013 are black. And at the same time, Black people are 13% of the US population. So over the past few years, especially with the Black Lives Matter movement, we've been talking about anti-Blackness or anti-Black racism to highlight the disparities uh, amongst communities of color, where you know, if we didn't disaggregate this, if we just looked at all people of color who had been in uh, these situations with police where their lives were lost or taken, then we wouldn't have this particular data point where we could see that, you know, although Black people are 13% of the population, they are overrepresented in these particular instances um, with law enforcement. 
over the past few months, um, our country has, I think, had a very pointed conversation about police interactions with Black people, but not just police interactions with Black people, especially uh, this instance of Ahmaud Arbery in February 23rd, where he was a Black man who was running, who was out for a jog, uh, and a group of white men believed him to be uh, a burglar in the neighborhood. They took it upon themselves to police the neighborhood, like a neighborhood watch situation. And if you've seen the footage, um, you know, they abruptly stopped Mr. Arbery, uh, and he was killed in broad daylight. So I put these names up to highlight that violence against Black people is not just uh, an issue that we see uh, in the dynamics with law enforcement, but also interpersonally, as in the case with Ahmaud Arbery. And that it has these origins in policing, right? These white men were in a neighborhood, they thought Ahmaud Arbery was a burglar and they took it upon themselves uh, to handle the situation, which is part of the origins of uh, policing in general, right? People who take it upon themselves, albeit institutionally, uh, you know, recognized or informally as a neighborhood watch group, which is the origins of the police department in Boston. Um, unfortunately, transgender people face very high rates of interpersonal violence. In the United States, uh, LGBT people uh, face a very high rate of hate crimes. But then when you break that down further, you'll see that transgender people face the highest um, rate of fatalities. So they are killed more often. And within the transgender community, it's particularly uh, Black trans women or trans women of color. And over the summer, it was a very high profile instance of these three um, trans women who were not killed, but they were harassed and hurt in a, a hate crime that was captured on smartphones uh, and released widely on social media. And so I just wanted to, I guess, kind of tie some things together that gender policing happens informally, that trans women face a whole different set of animosity and, and violence that I do not face because I'm someone who presents more masculinely, that Trans women um, are policed for their appearance, uh, for being feminine uh, in a society that is patriarchal and misogynistic. And we see the conflation of both racism and gender policing when it comes to uh, transgender women, especially transgender women of color. So I also wanted to share that I'm also a survivor of a hate crime. And so that this can happen to anyone uh, so that's just a, a picture of my eye. Uh, I had to get stitches. I was uh, you know, assaulted and hit in the face a few times. And you know, in these situations, it, it can happen to anyone. This particular person, you know, didn't like how I was dressed. They didn't like how I what I looked like. Um, they made some comments to me that were very inappropriate. Uh, and I engaged in you know, standing up for myself. And I was like, you know, you really can't say that stuff to people. And this person uh, was not in a space to have a conversation, so it, it turned physical. I've been boxing very seriously ever since that happened to me because I've never thought that something like that could happen to me. But you know, thinking about national statistics, that there is a rise in uh, violence directed at transgender and gender nonconforming people, it is something that I I do encourage everyone to think about, uh, particularly transgender people of color, that we do have to think about our self-defense and being in a position to protect ourselves. So I had uh, a reflection for folks to just kind of take a minute to think about, you know, any early memories that they had from their families or, or anywhere, media, friends, teachers, to think about, you know, anti-Blackness internally and how we've internalized it. So it's not just white people that have internalized anti-Blackness. People of color also have internalized anti-Blackness. Black people can have internalized anti-Blackness. So everyone can internalize anti-Blackness. It's a part of our society. And so the way that we combat that and change that, I think, starts with self-reflection. So thinking about any messages that you have received um, throughout your life, you know, earliest ones. So for me, as I mentioned, right, being called negra, negrita, morena, preta, like these words that were attributed to me to point out my black features, I think were the earliest memories that I have uh, about anti-blackness. So we don't have to share this, but this is just uh, an idea for y'all to engage in, you know, on your own time to disrupt anti-Blackness, it starts within. 
And I just want to leave us on this note of disruption. Uh, so part of the title of this is called Negra Nesia, which means uh, negra, as we said, is black, right? And Nesia is a Spanish word for someone who doesn't listen. Uh, in Spanish, when you have the A at the end, uh, that denotes someone who's read as a woman or feminine. So this is something that I was called growing up, negra nesia, and I was just a rambunctious, disobedient child. And so um, it has become the title of my presentations here. And so I wanna talk about how, although I recognize that I live in a society that has many restrictions on me and people like me, right? LGBT people are not accepted everywhere. We have anti-blackness everywhere. And someone like me is kind of at the middle of all these things as an Afro-Latinx person. Um, I'm not gonna sit by and take it. You know, I'm gonna live my life. I'm gonna be myself. There are other people uh, like me who are doing the same. And that that comes with a consequence, as I mentioned, right? Being a hate crime survivor. But there's also some positive things that I have experienced that I wanted to share. So part of my work, as I mentioned, has been talking about um, transgender rights and trans inclusivity in businesses. So I've been very fortunate to be featured in prominent publications like the Huffington Post or Business Insider. Um, I've done some modeling, which at 35 years old, I did not think I would be able to do at this age, but that picture in the center is um, from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Uh, last year, they had a really big exhibit called Gender Bending Fashion. And on their opening night, uh, they had a fashion show featuring some uh, queer and trans designers. So I was able to model for Stuzo, which is a black uh, founded queer fashion company in LA. And then the picture on the right with the swords uh, comes from a group out in Oakland where I used to live um, called Color Block. So it's a publication for queer and trans people of color. So I guess for the you know, queer and trans folks on the line, I just want to say that although we do face so many barriers uh, and violence, there are also spaces where we can free ourselves, where we can be encouraged to express ourselves in ways that we can't do uh, every day on the street safely. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important for me to show balance, right? So I'm going to show you statistics on the horrible things that we experience. I also want to show you some things that are affirming and positive too. And I mentioned colonization. So one thing that I have found to be very empowering is studying more about my history and the history of my people before colonization. So what I learned is that in uh, South America, particularly in the Incan region, uh, where the Andes Mountains are, uh, the indigenous people of the Andes recognized multiple genders, and they even had ancient sacred deities uh, where they recognized that you know people were beyond just man or woman. Um, and it's not just exclusive to you know South American people. We know here in this land, two spirit people, uh, the indigenous cultures. We know in uh, Mexico, India, for example, that there are many. Uh, types of gender variants that have been celebrated across cultures. So this is a, an Incan god uh, here. Also for the academics uh, on the line, there's really great scholarship highlighting queer histories of uh, Latino uh, communities, Latinx communities. So for me and my people, Ecuadorians, I found this article to be very helpful uh, that highlighted the queer histories of the Ecuadorian coast. And it's a really great, images of transgender people in this region. So these were some of the pictures. Um, so if you read this article, you learn that this is a coastal community, a shipping community, and that they have a very long history of queerness uh, native to this land, that these uh, folks are you know, respected members of their community and they have been experimenting with gender variance since you know, recorded history. This is another photo. Sorry, COVID-19, you know, I have a coworker in the background making a, a late lunch. Um, so here's another you know, question for reflection if anyone feels inspired to share, I would appreciate that. So thinking about how you liberate your gender and how you encourage the gender expression of others. So I really appreciated you know, Kathy's question about you know, the curriculum. So if you are someone who is an educator, you know, how can you encourage the gender expression of your students, for example?
Anybody? What do you think? How can we encourage the gender expression of others? I got to hear at least one person. Amazing, Christopher. I think you have to unmute yourself. There you go. Yeah, I was just waiting for it to uh, clear. I just, uh, I at least want to share a story. I'm, I'm much older than you are. So I, I grew up without much uh, opportunity to understand um, some of the issues. But, you know, it's interesting to me that, you know, I'm a father, I have two, two daughters and a, and a son. And I just remember uh, we, we grew up in Massachusetts. So uh, one time we had uh, Little League was in one town, my son and daughter played on the same team. And then we moved to the neighboring town and my daughter had to play softball and my son had to play baseball. And as a dad, you know, I, I really was mixed to say, you know, this is just wrong. <laughs> and I apologize that it's wrong, but I, I volunteered to coach. And, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate that most of the time when I coached that most of them were, um, you know, unisex uh, team. So anyone could play. And, you know, I think that in some ways it almost starts at home where you want to make sure that even though I didn't grow up, I certainly didn't grow up in a very progressive environment, I'll, I'll say that, that, you know, I think it's incumbent upon us all to, to try not to perpetuate that and to try to, to understand and, and grow and make sure we don't pass that along to the next generation. And, you know, I just wanted to say I appreciate, um, you know, I, I think this is great to, to have people that are courageous that come forward and talk about some of the struggles of what it's like to, to be different in, in a society that does not encourage that, quite honestly. So I, I applaud your um, coming forward and having the conversation. And I just wanted to, I mean, it's probably not that significant of a story, but I think it's important to how we each live our lives to, to not perpetuate uh, what we know to be uh, really wrong in my mind. So I, I appreciate your, uh, your talk this, this afternoon. Well, thank you, Christopher. And I do think it's a significant story. You know, you're talking about how you are imparting this work in your household, you know, and that you have seen stark differences in the opportunities uh, available to people on the basis of gender, right? You know, I, I don't know your, your family or your daughter, but I can imagine that there is some disappointment in realizing that, oh, you know, I, I love baseball, but now I, I can't play this sport because I'm a girl, you know? And so, yeah, I, I do think that that's a, you know, an unfortunate experience, but one that you know, perfectly shows this point that you know, we are limiting people's opportunity on the basis of gender, things that people enjoy doing. There's these arbitrary ways that gender is policed, right? So what message does that send to your daughter, right? Girls can't play baseball. And so, yeah, I think that was a, a wonderful contribution. So thank you, Christopher. Thank you. Um, I think I just had like a couple more slides and then we'll just open it up to anybody that has questions. So we can just go to the next one. Um, so I think the last notes I have here are about my work in higher education. So yes, I have a few jobs at the moment. Uh, my full-time job is at uh, MGHIHP. I do consulting. I'm also a teaching fellow at Harvard right now. So pretty busy. Um, but you know, my work is about changing systems and working with educational institutions as a place where we can start to experiment with creating the world that we wanna see. And the world that I wanna see uh, is equal opportunity for everybody, that we don't restrict people on the basis of gender. And you know, my mission, I guess, has been businesses and, and higher education. So I just highlighted uh, this recent article that I and my supervisor uh, published in Diverse Issues in Higher Ed, where we're focusing on anti-oppressive practices in higher education. Um, there's a lot of talk right now about anti-racism work, 
right? Like people want to be anti-racist. They want their businesses or their workplaces to be anti-racist. And I think that's great and necessary. But I personally think, my boss and I think, that if you have an anti-oppressive framework, it's broader. So anti-oppression is inherently anti-racist. It's also anti gender discrimination and it's anti you know, transphobia and it's anti classism. So anti-oppression, I think is like the umbrella that holds all of these other isms. And so how do I create an anti-oppressive institution? Well, your dress code, for example, right? A dress code that restricts people's attire on the basis of gender to me is a form of oppression. Anyone should be able to wear what they want, albeit you know, some guidelines on exposing different parts of your body, right? I think there needs to be some restrictions, but the sentiment is that, you know, we want people to be able to express themselves fully. Um, and so that's an example of like an anti-oppressive policy. But then, you know, in the curriculum, you know, Kathy's point, including LGBT perspectives in curriculum, I think not ever seeing yourself or only having curriculum that features heterosexuality, I think is a form of oppression. You know, you're only teaching people about one way of being when homosexual people exist, we've always existed, queer people exist, trans people exist. So I think having a more inclusive curriculum is a form of anti-oppression. I think the term can maybe be scary, but when you unpack it, what it really means is inclusion and freedom. And then, you know, I had this last question, but I know that some people have some prepared questions, so I'm just going to stop here. But I hope that this talk uh, inspires you to just think about other anti-oppressive policies that you can create or implement um, in your institutions, even in your in your homes and households. You know, I think even Christopher's example, uh, you know, encouraging my daughter to play the sports that she wants, I think is a form of you know, anti-oppression in your own house. Encouraging my kids to wear what they want and study what they want and to encourage them, I think is a form of making anti-oppression a part of your life. So that's it for me. Um, and I'm going to stop here and thank you all for listening and, and sharing. And I think there's a few questions. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, hi, I'm, um, my name is Jen. I also use they, them, theirs pronouns. Uh, I'm a Four Seas alumni and uh, Brazilian. <laughs> nice. Um, so yeah, some of the questions I kind of like wrote for you was like, one of them was like, how do you think we can reduce or even like eliminate gender policing and stop the, like the binary normative ideologies? Thank you. Um, I think there's the interpersonal levels. Okay, there's the individual level first in ourselves. Then there's the interpersonal level with other people. And then there's the institutional level, right? Like the hospitals, <laughs> the businesses, the practices. Um, so I see it as a continuum, you know, which is why I had some of these questions you know, to reflect on yourself. Like, I don't think we can create a gender inclusive world, or maybe to be a little bit more specific, a United States without individuals examining themselves, their own practices, how they do that with other people, and then questioning the practices of the institutions that we work for or you know, own or a part of. Right. Um, another one would be um, like being a Latin Latinx person and with, with the, the whole machismo thing. Um, did you experience like any prejudice for being a gender non-conforming person on your household with family and stuff? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> um, so in my family, right, my mom, my dad, love them, amazing people, so grateful. Um, I have a younger brother. Now, my brother is gay, uh, and he came out to my parents, but he is cisgendered, right? So he's a cisgendered gay man, and I am not cisgendered, and I'm queer. And so in my family, you know, I felt like my parents, I mean, they definitely had like some learning to do. I mean, both of your kids are not straight, so I don't know. I felt comfortable knowing that my brother was also gay. I was like, well, they can't kick us both out, frankly, because a lot of LGBT people are kicked out of their homes for being uh, queer or LGB and they are disowned. And so, you know, I was actually scared to come out for a while to my parents because I didn't know 
how it would be received. Um, but once my brother came out, I was like, great, like we're in cahoots, right? Um, but with the gender stuff, you know, it is different because my brother, you know, identifies as a man. He feels comfortable in that. Um, and he is not like gender queer visibly in the way that I am. Uh, like he's not someone who gets misgendered, right? And so there's a difference there, although we're both not straight. I think the gender variance presents another level. And so in terms of the prejudices, you know, I think my parents in particular um, have been very supportive, but like there's still like little comments. Sometimes like my mom will be like, you know, are you ever just going to grow your hair out? And I'm like, no, mom, I'm 35 years old. Like <laughs> this is what it is, right? Like we're just here right now. Um, and so I think she's like coming around to it. And I think in general in like Latinx communities, homophobia is a thing. Latinx people yeah. have a very strong presence of Christianity because of colonization, right? The Jesuits um, and their presence. And so I think part of machismo is also tied to like a very strong religious component. So homosexuality is not encouraged. And then you add the other layer of like, not only are you not straight, but then like you want to dress differently and do all these other things. It can be a lot. Yeah. Um, and just another thing I wanted to like, kind of like talk to you about of something I like noticed with the whole like rooting of, of words and like how things are worded. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think about the term Latinx? Because at least like for Portuguese, um, we started using the X to like neutralize the language, mm -hmm. um, but then they changed it because it's um, hard for, um, uh, for people to like actually read and pronounce it. Mm -hmm. So we changed it to E or U ending the word. So like Latinx, I feel like it should be ended with E mm -hmm. to make it more easy, like it's make, make it easier to pronounce. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I just wanted to hear like a, another Latina person. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, very, it's very controversial, <laughs> as you said. Um, you know, I've heard these debates too, that X seems like a Western imposition, that it's like a United States, you know, English, Spanish speaking thing that other countries who don't speak English, as you're saying, um, are confronted with more challenges. So I've heard that, I've, I've heard Latine as a substitute. Yeah. I personally, so X to me is like a visual statement where you know we're just disrupting the binary with the x there and so i'm not saying that i think x is better than e or other substitutes but it's what i have been using you know, i'm open to using latin a for myself too uh, and you're right i do think the x makes it more complicated for people to say things <laughs> yep uh and i feel that's it for the questions thank you <laughs> and just to wrap up today if nobody else has any questions i guess um i just wanted to put here about what i do as well i also um have a youtube channel that i talk about gender and sexuality awesome um which is just my name, it's Jean Cursino. If you look me up on YouTube, you'll find it. Um, I'd like to remind people to vote, that it's important. We are like in the huge moment right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you have the ability to vote, do so, please. <laughs> and uh, just remind people of we that we are also meeting tomorrow. We having Dr. Jose Laura talking about the relationship between race, power, and privilege, and the uh, production of media images and uh, the production of storytelling and what it is to be Latinx tomorrow at 2 p.m. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the questions and for having me here. Thank you.